In this video, you'll be shown how neurons, the primary cells of our nervous system, are structured and how they communicate with one another. These basic concepts will help you to understand the techniques we're going to discuss in video 5 that are used by circadian biologists and other neuroscientists to detect, measure, and experimentally manipulate neurons and their electrical and chemical outputs. In class, we'll be discussing specific, important concepts and findings in circadian biology, and to do so, we need all students to have a basic knowledge of neurobiology and an understanding of some common techniques used in the field. Circadian biologists examine circadian functions at all levels of the organism. As you saw in the primer for molecular biology, scientists can study gene expression within a cell. They can also look at activity at the level of the whole cell, or study how networks of cells interact. And they can look at the cells and proteins in vivo, or in a live organism, or in vitro, which is outside the normal biological context, like in a solution or other medium. And they can do this within specific tissues, like the brain or liver. Finally, scientists can look at the whole organism, including outputs like behavior. And part of how we build convincing arguments in circadian science is to demonstrate an effect or concept at multiple levels. So throughout this video, as you're introduced to the properties of cells in the brain and how we investigate them, think about circadian biologists and how they might apply these concepts and techniques to help them answer specific questions about how rhythms are generated in a neuron in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, of the hypothalamus, which is the central pacemaker in mammals, and how that neuron communicates with other neurons in the SCN network to produce synchronized rhythms, and how that structure lies within the context of a whole behaving organism. What will follow is the first of three short videos from a series called Two Minute Neuroscience, which is available on YouTube. We'll use these to introduce you to neurons. To start off, in this first video, we'll take a look at the structure of neurons. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the neuron. This is a brain. Estimates vary, but right now the best guess seems to be that our brains contain around 85 billion neurons. The neuron is a nerve cell, and it's the primary functional unit of the nervous system. This is a generic image of a neuron. Neurons actually come in all shapes and sizes, but this is the prototypical version of a neuron that you'll often see in a textbook. The structures extending from the left side of the neuron that look a little bit like tree branches are called dendrites. Dendrites are the area where neurons receive most of their information. There are receptors on dendrites that are designed to pick up signals from other neurons that come in the form of chemicals called neurotransmitters. Those signals picked up by dendrites cause electrical changes in a neuron that are interpreted in an area called the soma, or the cell body. The soma contains the nucleus, which contains the DNA, or genetic material, of the cell. The soma takes all the information from the dendrites and puts it together in an area called the axon hillock. If the signal coming from the dendrites is strong enough, then a signal is sent to the next part of the neuron, which is called the axon. At this point, the signal is called an action potential. The action potential travels down the axon, which is covered with myelin, an insulatory material that helps to prevent the signal from degrading. The last step for the action potential is the axon terminals, also known as synaptic buttons. When the signal reaches the axon terminals, it can cause the release of neurotransmitter. These purple structures represent the dendrites of another neuron. When a neurotransmitter is released from axon terminals, it interacts with the receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron, and then the process repeats with the next neuron. Next, we'll discuss how neurons communicate with one another via chemical signals across the synapse between two neurons. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss synaptic transmission. Most communication between neurons occurs at a specialized structure called a synapse. A synapse is an area where two neurons come close enough to one another that they are able to pass chemical signals from one cell to another. The neurons are not actually connected, but are separated by a microscopically small space called the synaptic cleft. The cleft is less than 40 nanometers wide. By comparison, a human hair is about 75,000 nanometers wide. The neuron where the signal is initiated is called the presynaptic neuron, while the neuron that receives the signal is called the postsynaptic neuron. 
In the presynaptic neuron, there are chemical signals called neurotransmitters that are packaged into small sacs called vesicles. Each vesicle can contain thousands of neurotransmitter molecules. When the presynaptic neuron is excited by an electrical signal called an action potential, this causes the vesicles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release their contents into the synaptic cleft. Once they are in the synaptic cleft, neurotransmitters interact with receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. They bind to these receptors and can cause an action to occur in the postsynaptic cell as a result. This action may involve increasing the likelihood that the postsynaptic cell will become activated and fire an action potential, or decreasing it. Eventually, the neurotransmitter molecules must be cleared from the synaptic cleft. Some of them will simply drift away in a process called diffusion. In some cases, the neurotransmitter is taken back up into the presynaptic neuron in a process called reuptake. Once back inside the presynaptic neuron, the neurotransmitter can be recycled and reused. In other cases, enzymes break down the neurotransmitter within the synaptic cleft. Then the component parts of the neurotransmitter can be sent back into the presynaptic neuron to make more neurotransmitter. Finally, we'll look at how neurons fire or produce the action potentials which generate the chemical communication at the synapse between two neurons that we just saw in the last clip. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the action potential. The action potential is a momentary reversal of membrane potential that is the basis for electrical signaling within neurons. If you're unfamiliar with membrane potential, you may want to watch my video on membrane potential before watching this video. The resting membrane potential of a neuron is around negative 70 millivolts. When neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the dendrites of a neuron, they can have an effect on the neuron known as depolarization. This means that they make the membrane potential less polarized or cause it to move closer to zero. This chart shows membrane potential on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. When neurotransmitters interacting with receptors causes repeated depolarization of the neuron, Eventually, the neuron reaches what is known as its threshold membrane potential. In a neuron with a membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts, this is generally around negative 55 millivolts. When threshold is reached, a large number of sodium channels open, allowing positively charged sodium ions into the cell. This causes massive depolarization of the neuron as the membrane potential reaches zero and then becomes positive. This is known as the rising phase of the action potential. The influx of positive ions creates the electrical signal known as the action potential, which then travels down the neuron. Eventually, the action potential reaches its peak. Sodium channels close and potassium channels open, which allows potassium to flow out of the cell. This loss of positive potassium ions promotes repolarization, which is known as the falling phase of the action potential. The neuron returns to resting membrane potential, but actually overshoots it, and the cell becomes hyperpolarized. During this phase, known as the refractory period, it is very difficult to cause the neuron to fire again. Eventually, the potassium channels close and the membrane returns to resting membrane potential ready to be activated again. The signal generated by the action potential travels down the neuron and can cause release of neurotransmitter at the axon terminals to pass the signal to the next neuron. That's it for the neuron. Click here to watch the next video in this series.